Welcome to this service from Youthful with Trinity Gask and Kinkale Parish Church. What I'm going to do over the next few weeks is think about what Jesus did after the resurrection. We know that he spent about 40 days with his disciples. What did he do in those 40 days? At the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles it tells us that he showed them with many convincing proofs that he was alive. And that's an important part of that because the disciples, like anybody else, knew that people who are dead don't come back to life. They weren't stupid. They weren't gullible. They needed to be convinced. The man who had been crucified by the Romans was now alive again. And Jesus spent 40 days convincing them of that. But also speaking to them about the kingdom of God. I wonder what he said. We do have a record of what he taught them, which makes me think that it was probably going over what he had told them in the previous three years, reinforcing it and, and emphasising it and helping them to remember it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, as it were, gave a manifesto of the Kingdom of God, teaching about what it means to live in that Kingdom. And I imagine it would be that kind of teaching, probably, that Jesus would have been explaining it, maybe in a bit more detail to them over those 40 days. So over the next few weeks we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which may well have been the kind of thing that Jesus was teaching his disciples in those 40 days. In the church before the lockdown we were looking at the first part of that, the Beatitudes, and in this service and the following uh, services we're going to be looking at the remainder of that Sermon on the Mount. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. Enjoy the service.
scripture reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20 and 43 to 48. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen.
Desmond Tutu, the, the famous bishop from South Africa, once said, We may be surprised at the people we find in heaven. God has a soft spot for sinners. His standards are quite low. What do you make of that? I think the first bit is great. We will be surprised in heaven. God does have a soft spot for sinners. I'm not so sure about the second. His standards are quite low. That's not what I read when I read Matthew chapter 5, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus speaks about God's law. The Pharisees at that time, the teachers of the law, were very particular about keeping God's law. They hedged that law around with all kinds of other rules and regulations so that they could define what exactly it meant by not murdering or about resting on, on the, the Sabbath and so on. And Jesus says to his followers, you've got to be better than them, more righteous than them, or you're not even going to see the kingdom of God. That doesn't sound to me like low standards at all. But in fact, Jesus goes even further, much, much further. He says, yes, the, the law says, don't kill, don't murder. But I say, don't even get angry. The law says, don't commit adultery. But I say, don't even think about it. Don't even look at him or her in that way. The law says, love your neighbour. But I say, go much, much further. Love your enemy. The law says, be just. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth means only an eye for an eye and only a tooth for a tooth. But I say, go much further. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. That doesn't sound to me like low standards at all. That sounds to me like the highest possible standards. That sounds to me like God has given us a ladder to climb into heaven and each rung of that ladder is one of the laws. But like the children's game, there are snakes about and when I break the law, I slide right back to the beginning and start all over again. That's exactly what James says in chapter 2 and verse 10 when he says if we break one of the smallest of God's commandments we're guilty of breaking them all. What hope is there then? If that's what my heart is like the only possibility is a new heart. And God does have a soft spot for sinners because that's exactly what he promises us. Jeremiah chapter 31 for example. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31 says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, a new relationship between God and his people. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, in verse 33, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. He talks there about giving us a new heart and a new mind with God's law already in it. How is that possible? It's possible because we don't need a ladder. We need a lifeboat. And it's exactly a lifeboat that God has given to us in Jesus. Now the only people who will climb into a lifeboat are those who are drowning. Those who think they're strong enough to swim won't bother. But those who know they're drowning will make for that lifeboat as if their life depends on it, because their life does depend on it. And the spiritual lifeboat that is Jesus is full of sinners saved by God's grace, because his love has provided us for that lifeboat. And when we're in that lifeboat, we're in Christ. How we get that new heart, that new life, is by asking Jesus to come into our old hearts and changing them. And he'll melt them. And asking Jesus to give us his spirit. And his spirit remoulds our heart to become more like his. To enable us to be like him. He was the only one who ever kept God's law in its entirety. And only through him can we even begin to hope to keep that law from our hearts in our minds, because we want to. Loving not just our neighbours, but our enemies, something which goes against the grain. But that's exactly 
the kind of heart that, that Jesus is going to give to, uh, to us. Not a natural one, but a supernatural one. That's the new relationship with God that we can have through him. That's how we can begin to keep God's law. Be acceptable to be him, to be good enough for him. That's how we can begin to live in God's kingdom, here and now, and for eternity. Loving Father, we thank you that you are the God who knows. You know us all together, our secret fears, our hidden anxieties, our hopes and dreams. You see where we are. And because you are the God of steadfast love and faithfulness, you welcome us into your presence just as we are wanting to hold us within your love until we are whole again. Whole because renewed in faith, in hope and in the strength which you supply. We thank you also that you are the God who reigns, reigns in majesty, reigns in power, working out your long-term purposes to an end beyond our imagining. You are never caught unawares, but remain steadfast in your purposes, as you are enduring in your love. We thank you therefore this day in the midst of the turmoil and uncertainties that rack our world, that you are the eternal, almighty, ever-present God, who works all things together for good, for all who love you, and for the world that you love. We look forward to that day when the whole earth shall be full of your glory. Encourage our hearts in the hope that is in you, with the peace that comes from trusting in your purposes and with the steadfastness that looks to you for the fulfilment of all our needs, today, tomorrow, and in all the future. As you, Lord Jesus, intercede for us, so we come before you interceding for each other. We pray for all who are haunted by fear, fear for themselves in the unseen dangers they sense all around. Fear for those they love, whose jobs place them at risk, or whose livelihoods are threatened. We pray for all who watch the news with foreboding, or who lie awake at night imagining all that may yet come. God of grace and loving kindness, turn their hearts to you, reveal yourself to them in the reality of your presence, in the reality of your power, and in the reality of your love. Teach them to pray, grant them grace to trust. In mercy bestow upon them the gift of your peace. We pray for all who live daily with a sense of loneliness and isolation, which encloses them like a chill fog and who feel the weight and weariness of daily routines which suddenly seem pointless. Father of grace and mercy, draw near to all such prisoners of loneliness. Teach them to know the reality of your companionship. Teach them to feel how precious they are to you. Teach them to find joy in little things blossom on a tree, a bird singing on a branch, the glow of the sunset sky, and give to them the grace of trust and of a thankful heart, as they find in you the one who is an ever-present help in trouble and whose love endures forever. 
we pray for all whose work places them at special risk, and who are torn between the conflicting claims of work and family. God of all wisdom and grace, draw near to all such troubled ones. Grant your clear guidance and the miracle of your peace. We pray for all who have found unexpected benefits from this lockdown, who have found new hobbies or rediscovered neglected skills or interests, or who have simply experienced an enhanced sense of well-being from a more relaxed lifestyle. Help us all to look again at our lifestyle priorities and to see where it might be right to set new goals for the future. We pray for all in government in this nation and round the world as they bear the responsibility of making decisions that impact the lives of many. Grant them wisdom, direct their thinking and planning that there might be efficiency and good management in the procurement and distribution of vital resources. Guide them in all decisions regarding the timing of the reopening of businesses and schools. Give them vision and clear-sightedness. As they look ahead, set new priorities, take decisions about the allocation of resources the shaping of society and the management of the economy in the difficult days ahead. And raise up leaders of integrity around the world whose desire is to serve and work for the healing of the nations, who can inspire confidence and loyalty in their people and enable the nations of the world to face the future with realism and with hope. We pray for all scientists working in laboratories around the world for an effective vaccine against COVID-19. Grant them wisdom, inspiration and wise cooperation in the sharing of insights gained. That the nations of the world may be set free from fear and find health and well-being again. Keep all your people in every nation steadfast in faith constant in prayer and courageous in witness and to your name be all the glory now and forever. Amen.
Thank you for sharing this worship with us. There'll be another service next week. And in the meantime, may you know God's blessing, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of this Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.